Hello there. I'm Mean Brister, and I'd like to welcome you to the joy of puzzles. I invite you to grab your preferred setting tools so you can follow along with us as we set a 6x6 killer Sudoku from scratch. Now, if you've never set a Sudoku before, don't be intimidated. We'll be walking through each and every step along the way, as well as showing you how to use this software, Sudoku Maker. If you prefer F puzzles, the links are in the description below, and I have a previous video which I will link to as well, next to the F puzzles link, where I go through the same process for a thermometer 9x9 Sudoku in F puzzles. Today we're going to be using Sudoku Maker because I've been setting with Sudoku Maker a lot more than F puzzles recently. Sudoku Maker is mobile friendly, which means that if you're on your phone right now, you don't have to hop on your laptop, you can just set on your phone. So the first thing that we're going to do to make this a 6x6 Sudoku is press on this new button over here. And once you press on that new button, it's going to bring up this little window. Click on this Sudoku size and set it to 6x6 and press create. So if you want to add given digits, you simply click on this little thing here and then you can write them in. If you're not selected on there, then you're going to be putting in blue digits, which are not given digits. We're going to add one constraint. You can type in killer cages or you can scroll down and find it here. Whenever we want to add a killer cage, we're just going to select this little box on the right, put your cursor over it, and then drag in the grid to create cages. If you want to add a total to your cage, you're going to write in the numbers. Now, what is Killer Sudoku? Well, Killer Sudoku is pretty simple. If I have something like this, then these two cells need to sum to the clue in the top left corner without repeating. So if we were to draw something like this and make it 12, this digit and this digit couldn't be something like double three with six because it's highlighting in red because that is not allowed. You can't repeat digits in a killer cage. If we want to delete a killer cage, we can just press this delete instead of add and edit and then click on the one that you want to delete. To begin this guided Sudoku setting, we're going to utilize the secret. Now the secret is something that some of you might already know, but maybe you know a different secret. All the digits in every row and column and box of a six by six Sudoku sum to 21. No, not 45, Simon, stop. Now this is a secret that I only tell my best friends, but if you're watching this, you are one of my best friends. And therefore, I will tell you, no, not 45. It is 21. The digits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 sum to 21. That's because there's no 7, 8, or 9s in any 6x6 Sudokus. So we don't sum to 45. We sum to 21. Let's remember that 21 when we place our first two clues into box 1. This is box 1, and we're going to place two cages in here. They can be two or three cells, but don't fill all the cells up with cages. What we want to do is we want to use the fact that we know that all six of these digits in box one sum to 21. And we're going to put in two cages in here, which allow us to deduce the value of whatever is left over. If you have two, two cell cages, then you want to deduce the contents of the leftover digits. Leftover digits being the ones not in cages. If you have a two cell and a three cell cage, then you want to deduce the value of the leftover cell. One, two, and three cell cage would be a little bit easier. So if it's your first time setting, maybe try the two and three cell cage. I'll give you a minute to figure that out and put your own clues in. Feel free to play around with the with the values, the, the clues, and see if you can logically determine what the digits that are not in the cages have to be. Feel free to pause the video. And I'm going to show an example. Let's try to make the two digits that are not in the cages sum to 11. 
which can only be made up of 5 and 6, because 4 and 7 doesn't work because there's no 7 in a 6x6, six 6. 3 and 8 won't work because there's no 8 in a 6x6, six six. and 2 and 9 won't work because there's no 9 in a 6x6. Six six. So the only option would be 5 and 6 in that case. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the two other cages add up to 21 minus 11. 21 minus 11 is 10. So we can make two 5 cages. And we don't know what order these go in. They have to have the digits 1, 2, 3, and 4 in them, but that leaves 5 and 6. Make sure to always check your work. So if you think you figured something out, but you're not too sure, you can always feel free to click this little light bulb button over here, and it'll tell you whether or not the puzzle that you're making has a solution. If it pops up and says the puzzle is impossible, then you know you've made a mistake and you need to look at your logic again. So examine one of your two cell cages. So if you made a two cell cage and a three cell cage, then you're going to look at your two cell cage. And ideally, the, the cage itself, the value of the cage itself, should have two different options. Much like five has either one, four, or two, three. 1 and 4 and 2 and 3 both sum to 5. So there's two options. What we don't want is there to be one option or three options. One option would be 11 or 10. 10 can only be made up of 4 and 6. What about 7? Well, 7 is kind of in the middle and it can be made up in three different ways. 1, 6, 2, 5, or 3, 4. Now I know that a 7 cage in something like this would not be able to have all three options, but I'm talking about the value of the cage rather than what the actual contents are in your puzzle itself. And that's because we're going to add another cage that has that same value. Find your two cell cage. If it's in one column entirely, then we're going to focus on that column. If it's in one row entirely, then we would be looking at this row. If you have a two cell cage and a three cell cage, then you're going to look at the two cell cage and whichever row or column it's in, you're going to look at those cells. And in those cells, you're going to find some place and you're going to add another cage that is perpendicular or the other way. If your two cell cage is vertical, you're going to place this one horizontally and make it a five. Say this, this five was two, three. Well, then this cell can't be two or three. So therefore we know that this cell also can't be two or three. That's an interesting thing about Variant Sudoku, rather than classic Sudoku. Variant Sudoku applies restrictions not only to the cells in a digit's house, which is the row, column, and box, but also to related cells. So you can build up relationships between cells. So this cell cannot be two or three, because that would make this cell either a two or three, and it can be neither. So therefore, this would have to be a one, four. Now we don't know what that is yet. If you have already your two cell cage filled in, that's okay too. If you want to pause and figure out where you want to place that, play around with it a little bit, but we'll come right back and fill in another clue. The next clue that we're going to fill in is in the opposite side of the grid. If your two cell cage was in a column, what you're going to look at is in the row that meets box. And we're going to put another cage in either two or three cells, which interacts with the leftover digits. So if you only have one leftover digit, you're going to put the cage in that row. If you have two leftover digits, then you could put the cage in either row. The idea behind this is to reward the solver for finding the leftover digits in box one. If you have only one digit that was left over, you're going to add either a two or a three cell cage, and that single digit will limit the options there. So for example, if we had six here, then we could put in an eight cage. And this six here would limit the options of the eight cage from being either two six or three five to only being three five, which will get us some information about these two cells. Now be sure you don't break these two cells with that deduction. Now, if you have 
a pair of digits, not just one digit, what we're going to try and do is set up what's called a virtual pair. And again, if this is your first time setting, you might want to listen to this, but more so tread towards the side where we're not using virtual pairs. Now, a virtual pair is a lot like a regular pair. We have a pair right here, a five and a six. A pair is two digits which are restricted to two cells. So five and six must go in these two cells. A virtual pair is a lot like that, except that we don't know exactly where the cells go. We just know approximately their location. For example, if we took these two cells and we put an eight here, well, we know that either it's three, five, and this is a six, or it's two, six, and this is a five. So regardless of what the actual contents of this are, there is either a five or a six in this cage. And there is a five or a six here. So this cage and this cell create a virtual pair, not a pair like this pair, but a pair that is spread across three cells. So then we can say that none of these cells could have five or six in them, because we know that the five and six in row two are already allocated to these three cells. Now feel free to pause the video and figure out your own cage that will make a virtual pair. It's a lot easier to make a two cell cage in this case, but we also have in, in this case, if, if we had one, four, and three, two, three here, it wouldn't matter which, which order they are in. Whichever the two, three is, we actually have another virtual pair because whichever the two, three is, there's going to be a two, three in there and there's a two, three in here. So we can actually say that this cell cannot be five, six, or two, three. The next thing I want to talk about is roping. Six by six Sudokus have a natural roping property to them. What do we mean by roping? One, two, three, and two, three, one here. Well, we can see obviously that these digits, since they appear here, well, if we do Sudoku on ones, we'll get ones down here. If we do Sudoku on twos, we'll get twos down here. And if we do Sudoku on threes, we'll get threes down here. So this is a triple, much like a pair, three digits, which are constrained to exactly three cells. But what's interesting is these cells, whatever digits they are, let's say they're five, six, seven, right? I don't know what they are, but let's say they're five, six, seven. These digits can't go here in this box. So they must go down here. And then again, doing five Sudoku on fives, we get fives in here, we get sixes in here, and we get sevens in here. So then the rest of these cells must be four, eight, and nine. You can see that these are all the same. These have all the same content. And these have all the same content. This is what we call roping. Now this happens in nine by nine Sudokus when exactly two rows of two boxes within three, col three rows or three columns have exactly the same contents. Then you get this roping pattern. But in six by six Sudoku, we actually have that roping pattern by default. If you look at these digits, whatever they are, have to appear down there. And whatever these digits are, have to appear down here. Now in nine by nine Sudoku, you can also have roping of the columns. Well, we could have that in six by six Sudoku. If we had, these are all the same, these would all be the same. And these could all be the same. That would, that could happen, but it's not implicitly true to say that we have column roping for a six by six Sudoku. But it is always true that we have roping in the rows for six by six Sudoku. So we just have that naturally. So generally in six by six Sudoku, we need to put a little bit of extra pressure on the columns to disambiguate them because the rows, they're kind of just the same, just in the other box. So to put a little bit of pressure on our columns, 
we're going to add a given digit either in boxes four or box six that utilizes this characteristic roping to get us some other digits. For example, we could put a one or four in here, which would immediately give us a one or four, but would also mean that there has to be a one, that one or four, which you put in here, down here. And we could further complicate things by putting it right in the exact place it doesn't want to go, right there. Why don't you try and figure out your own given digit somewhere in boxes four and six that gives you some other digits in the grid. So in our example, this one, this given one will give us a four here. And that, that nicely plays with this, this double virtual pair that we found in row two. You always want to think, how can I reward my solver for getting a deduction that I've put in my grid? How can I lead from one deduction to the next deduction? And this, this one naturally leads to that. And it makes this easier because we can just fill in two, three right away. We can fill in one, four right away, and we can fill in two, three. And then the, the virtual pair is much easier to see in that case. Now you should be finding that your grid is quite restricted at this point. I want you to try to eke out as much logic as you can from what you've put in the grid so far. And then, I want you to play around with a three to five cell cage. Ideally, this cage should interact with what we already have in the grid. It shouldn't introduce new deductions without using something that we already have. A four to five cell cage might not even have a clue in a six by six Sudoku because the non-repeating part of the killer Sudoku rule, which we may have forgotten already. So if I were to put a cage like that, then none of these cells could have four in them because digits are not allowed to repeat within cages. So again, it's, it's sort of like this one. We're applying a restriction to these two cells with this four, even though these two cells don't see this four. We can apply interesting deductions in variant Sudoku that's very different and makes for diverse deductions. We're going to try and add a three to five cell cage ideally without a numbered clue on it. Deductions like this, we sometimes refer to as geometric deductions. Geometric deductions because they don't rely on the value that is in the cell, but they rely on the relationship between that cell and other cells based on the shape, the geometry of the cage, of the clues, of the grid. Roving is another example of a geometric deduction, because it doesn't matter what digits are in here, those digits must go in here. It doesn't matter what their value is. A lot of geometric deductions could be expressed as this cell's value will be equal to that cell's value. Instead of saying this cell's value, that cell's value, what we'll do is we'll actually color a cell to refer to it as whatever this cell's value is, Let's say it's cream. It's a bit like algebra. Feel free to use coloring to deduce geometric type deductions. Once you place your cage, feel free to adjust whatever cages, digits, givens you've put in the grid to make this puzzle the best that it can be. Don't be afraid to go off of my suggestions. I'm simply here to guide you and give you some inspiration, but your hand is the final arbiter of what goes into this puzzle. I want you to make this work your own, and I really would love if you would share this work. I really hope that whatever comes of this puzzle that you're making right now, it's something that you're proud of. Sudoku is really easy to get a hold of, especially 6 by 6 Sudoku, and mess around with and have a lot of fun with. And I hope you're proud of whatever you've made and I hope it brings you a little bit of joy today. This has been The Joy of Puzzles. Thank you.